<laughs> so there's a lot of heavy metals here, so we're forming these puff balls, which have a natural tendency to absorb heavy metals. And then we can see what, what levels and what rates. Because that puff ball might be different from that one. You know, the rate of accumulation. So you gotta you gotta test all these. What's the best, where is the best place to isolate fungi for remediation? What better than right on site, right? Somewhere that's uh, already acclimated to contamination. If you're looking for, if this is in a grassy field like you have over here, there's a high probability that there's fungi there, right? There's molds, uh, and don't discount molds either. I mean, we're talking, this is a mushroom festival, but uh, it should be a mold. <laughs> they're all fungi, and I don't discount them because I see them on a plate. Uh, I was telling someone last night that I, I, I maintain salt water uh, at three and a half percent, and I just leave them out. And I leave them out because there's spores everywhere. Something's going to land on it, and something's going to eat it, right? And sure enough, you know, I've been having a hard time finding like oyster mushroom strains for you know adult cleanup, and these molds keep showing up. But go to the sites, collect, and increase. If you know what this background contamination is, you can put it in the auger, you can put it uh, in your media. You want to create a superbug, you want to create a race horse. Okay? You can do that. The mushroom I eat in the wild has all those genetics in it. This is like stuff that I put out, you know, on the Gulf. People help me help the planet. Um, and people without the skills or the will just think, hey, you know, Anyone can help the gulf still if you can turn in a mushroom found along the beach that's you know already naturally acclimated to salt. Um, it's a white rock fungus. These are some of the actually found, right? Um, but these oyster mushrooms right on the beach. So anybody can turn them in. So if you're if you're um, on vacation or you're in a, a coastal environment and you see mushrooms growing along the beach, please dry them and turn them in. I'd say very valuable for environmental uh, micromediation. So this is what I was finding in Haiti. <laughs> very common. Right? This is their uh, this is a uh, oil changing platform right inside the city, or outside actually in the mountains. And all this waste. I know you probably can't see this, but this is all oil cans and paper, and it's just piled up here. And when it rains, it actually comes down and goes down the hill. Right. This is where I would probably collect um, some of the fungi that are, you know, all these paper products here. Looking for mold, looking for anything. All right. So cloning a mushroom versus spores. Um, cloning a mushroom is, is a great idea. You take, open up that tissue, and you, you get that mushroom that's that's already acclimated to that contamination. That's great. But you can also Use this uh, mushroom as a, as a chance to get all this genetic diversity, which can, you can even get a, a you should be able to get a much better selection from these these spores if you germinate them on contaminated media. Do you, do you follow? Because all these spores are different; they have to mate. Uh, for them to germinate and, and try to mate, they're going to find a mate that is equally or better strong, and so they're combining those genetics to make it even stronger. So you can keep increasing the background contamination. Um, by using spores. And that's how you do it. You streak it on a contaminated plate, fill this with a uh, atrazine or a background contaminant. If they germinate and mate, you get growth that's a uh, very good linear growth. You've got a good strength. And so this is what the tips look like. Um, right? If, uh, if you're cultivating, if you're doing pastry plates, those are the hypo tips. These are the, uh, like the infantry cells. These are the cells that are taking chemical samples, right? They're the first ones on the scene. They're taking little samples, they're reporting back, they're restructuring their genetic expression to eat that material. So they're reporting back to the body and mycelium to create that metabolite to break down whatever it's trying to break down. You follow? They're sweating those enzymes. These are the ones that are programming the whole rest of the body and the mycelium. And this is evident in, in behavior plates. This is how you're training them, is you can make these behavior plates, and then you start to see them sweat some uh, natural antibiotics or compounds. All right, so 
How do they do this? <coughs> Mushrooms create heat, carbon dioxide, and they sweat water. Inside that water is the um, the enzymes. It's like uh, if you take a human being and turn them inside out. And don't do this at home. It's way too early. So if you turn, they're basically their stomach is on their outside of their bodies. All the enzymes, they're sweating and they're swimming through their stomach fluid. It's like they're swimming through their own septic tank. So later on, they're going to have to recruit some bacteria. What do we have in septic tanks? And they recruit and, and uh, propagate those bacteria to get the end product. They don't want to be swimming in, in toxins. So they recruit this bacteria to get the job done, right, to metabolize it. Um, white rot fungi are some of the best molecular disassemblers. They, they carry lignin and manganese peroxidase. And what this does is clean, this cleans huge molecules that resemble the, the lignin molecules. So lignin is the structural component of wood, the brownie component that you would see. It's a chemical lock. Behind that chemical lock, you've got cellulose and hemicellulose, um, everything for uh, sugars, uh, for cell uh, power. But what's interesting is the lignin molecule is very similar to hydrocarbons, the, the shapes. So the mushrooms can kind of misidentify a lot of our chemicals that we make. So uh, that's what's important about these enzymes. They're highly flexible and highly functional. Right? They're, they're, they're adaptable. And don't discount mycorrhizal fungi. We're also looking for mycorrhizae down on the, on the valley floor. We're looking for fungi that associate with plants, um, that live on the roots of those plants that have adapted to do that nutrient transport to the plant, but also to detoxify that soil. Strains, temperatures. This is really important. Um, this is one of the reasons I would never um, bring a mushroom from South Carolina and remediate here. We need native strains. You also need to be wary of the fruiting window or temperature window of the enzymes. What's the optimum uh, activity of those mushrooms? We might even be able to swap out a strain, like in, in, the, in the, uh, the biological filter we put behind the, the, the maintenance shed. We might run a warm season one in the summer install it in the spring and then switch out those wood chips and put like an anoki, do something that's really cold tolerant in that um, in that system, which you have to do the best operating windows of these enzymes. And you can do that in a, a growth chamber in a lab. Um, but if you don't have that, then just, just understand that you need those strains at different times of the year. Uh, these are floating islands. These are a great way to uh, adapt and attract uh, beneficial microbes. So you can have the rack filled with the mycelium, you float this, and then you can actually pick up this thing, this biofilm in a contaminated area, especially a, a, a water borne contaminant here, uh, chemical contaminant. You can partner and match up. Even there's mycorrhizae on these roots, even though they're anaerobic, because that plant's going to transport water down to the mycelium. All right? So then you can root harvest these and screen for different uh, mycorrhizae. I'm just watering through these units that we made. These are those little rescue modules that fruit mushrooms. Uh, just by exposing the media to a particular contaminant, uh, the fungus gets used to that. So the, the genetics that comes out of here, I would take spore prints from these, running them through the contaminant. And also, if you're running heavy metal through these water, guess what happens? Are those mushrooms edible? Okay. So they have to be disposed of. How do you dispose of them? That's the that's the biggest problem is composting them, um, using worms to, to further enlist the composting process, and then also planting more plants in that compost that absorb heavy metals. So you just keep magnifying it into a smaller amount. Um, that's kind of the the hardest part is, is where, what do you do with this? But it's, it's better to take, we were talking about, you know, 200,000 yards of contaminated soil and dispose of, you know, five pounds of concentrate. You can also mine it back out. Most companies are mining it for electronics. Uh, oyster mushrooms are some of the most versatile and diverse. Right? They have a lot of chemical keys, but they can break down a lot of 
different substrates. So how many people have keys in their pocket? How many do you have? Who has the least amount of keys? Zero. Two? Zero. Well, you you got to break down something. you got to have one. <laughs> one. One. How many? Who has the most? How many? Four? All right. So Travis is an oyster mushroom compared to all of us. He looks like one. Where are your gills at? Great right? oh, Wow, look at that. Um, and who has one? Yeah, so he, he has one. How many of you have one? Highly specialized. And we've seen that in habitat. So those mushrooms that are growing on a very specific substrate, it's kind of like the cordyceps. Um, Xylaria, like they just grow in gumballs and, and different magnolia cones. One key. That's what they do in nature habitat. Very difficult. Take a mushroom, pull in a mushroom like Travis, and he's got all these keys. Is he using them all the same one all the time? No. He can open up all these doors and he can also adapt. <coughs> and so how do you train them to eat pollution? This was on my slides last night. Just use different gradients of plates. See how see what they can do. Alright. They may not like it at first, but they're gonna they're gonna eat it. <laughs> they are gonna eat it. What's the worst food we can think of? Who's in my class Friday? Sweet potatoes. Sweet oh, oh, oh that I like that. I actually put sweet potatoes in my auger now. I love it. Let's try it. Um southern mushrooms. <laughs> so uh, I put grits in it. <laughs> not very well made. Okay, so in our class, we, we were doing uh, century eggs, which is a like a duck egg buried, like an embryo, for 100 years, and then we dig it up and we eat it. How would that be? So if we are all a body, or we're all different mushrooms, right, and we're locked in here, and they keep bringing us, the first day one, they bring a, a, a big steaming plate of these rotten duck embryos, who's going to eat that? You are? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I had All right, so day one, I'm not eating. Day two, probably not. But probably day three, four, and five, I think some of us are thinking about it. All right. So day five, day seven. So this is no different. Um, we're putting it on the auger. Um, oh, and how do you how do you uh, get that atrazine and whatever? I, this is a slide with the maitake, but pretend it says atrazine. It's the same same method. You would take a chemical, you don't want to autoclave your chemicals into the gel because that changes the chemical composition um, of, the, of the contaminant. So this is an herbicide. What you want to do is cook your auger, you let it cool down. I use the uh, digital thermometer to point at the auger. And when it gets about below 110, draw up your, uh, your uh, solution of your herbicide and then you can dispense it very easily. If you find the parts per million, um, do the math. But you need, this is a filter syringe. So draw it up, screw this on, and just put it, and then slowly depress it into your auger when it's below 110 degrees. Then it'll gel in. Okay. So the filter is in case you're half contaminated or yeah, the other side. Yeah. So is there a size of a filter? Like two tenths of a micron. Okay. It works pretty good. Um, and yeah, just dispense it just right into the auger, it gels. And, and do not use nutritive auger. Use regular auger. Not nutritive. Oh, we're starving them. <laughs> if they're not liking it, you can give them a little bit of food in there or reduce your like potato or a malt extract. But um, if you're really trying to, I hate to say it, torture them a little bit. Right behind the head. <laughs> right behind the hyphae. Sometimes I am. 
right behind my head, this is the body right behind the tips. Transfer that to even stronger grading. Okay? It's figured out the, the right combination of levels that it needs. Spawn can be made out of this and used directly in the field. It's extremely aggressive and it's strong. So you, you've got it in the right mindset to break things down. Right? Now it's a race course. It was a little pasture pony, now it's a race course. <laughs> Uh, I like using these gradient plates because it gives them a chance to stretch their legs and then reach a gradient. And when they hit it, they get a, get a whip of that media, they adjust their enzymes, and they're, they're all good. So these are nice. It, it, it eliminates a little bit of a shock factor. And then like motor oil. Okay? So whipping in different, this is right out of the bottle. I whipped it right into the auger as it was cooling. And sure enough, it just keeps getting stronger and stronger. <laughs> right, right out of the bottle. That's pretty cool. Really cool. That's another. That's a morel mycelium, morel fungus. Right. It's going out of uh, actually different. This is a different salt concentration. So I'm trying to see what happens when it hits these salts. Um, and it's also a very aggressive, fine growing fungus. It grows up to up to two inches a day. That mycelium. Really cool. And this particular mushroom backstreams a lot. That's that's one of the phenomenons of the morels. They backstream nutrients, and it's a heavy metal accumulator that loves to eat metals. Uh, they're using morels to mine gold now. Okay. The mycelium, because it accumulates so much gold. So when you find morels, the morels are full of gold. They really are. No wonder they're expensive. <laughs> if you analyze them, they're full of gold. Um, different galleries. So uh, I make, like I said, little gladiator matches on my pastry plates. This is what I do on Friday nights. <laughs> you know, um, this is where I'd rather be is just playing around with fungi, seeing what they can do, watch their behavior. They'll teach you something. All right, set up these little galleries, fungi, bacteria, or little wells with pollutants. Right, um, that's pretty much uh, the fungus just blasting right through these colonies. You know, didn't care. Tells me this fungus, this jack o' lantern. It's very aggressive. Uh, and I just have these little um, galleries. Go ahead. You know, uh, putting these cubes right directly on top of the contaminants. This is a bacterial contaminant, so I just made a lawn of bacteria, dropped them right on there. Um, you have to know what your target pollutant is. In the field, this is a shiitake mycelium. Look what happened right on top. You see it? This doesn't, shiitake mycelium doesn't do this, like, naturally, um, unless it's starting to get threatened. Now, if you leave a shiitake block of sawdust in the bag, what happens? It turns brown. Yeah, a lot of exudates. Um, but this particular one, that's after it completely colonizes the substrate. If you, you put the shiitake directly on the lawn of bacteria, look what it does. You know? Antibiotics very quickly, so all those little droplets are exudates that it's trying to make. All right? Little droplets, beautiful little amber chemical keys in there. All right? Um, and then we allow them to sense. All right? Just different galleries, just trying to see what they do. And the bacteria. So this is bacterial um, choice tests. <laughs> right? Perhaps your coat. <laughs> trying to get them to pick, to pick each other. So these, I'm trying to match up the bacteria again back to the parent fungus that I've cloned. So I, I make these little choice tests for the bacteria, the fungus. You can see how they're favoring the different pellets of the different mycelium, right? It's completely staying away from the other one. You know I don't have cable. This is awesome, right? You can, all right, so another thing you can do, uh, and this is really easy. We, I talked about this last night. He's making these little wells. Not only is it really good for inducing like all these beautiful, uh, yet to be discovered medicinal compounds. This is a, it's, it's you're doing the same method to train that fungus to exude a particular uh, enzyme or molecule. So look, after about two days, look how white. It makes a beautiful little well. Right? I open up the bag, this is all in sterile um, culture. I add the contaminant, either chemical or biological contaminant, 
put it right there. And the one on the left tells you quickly with the controls, like really how quickly this fungus responds to this level of fluid. And you can do this with different strains of this mushroom. Remember, you want ecotypes. And you can test the volume of fluid to know which one is producing better at what temperature, right? So this one is full of the chemical keys, and we can use this to harvest the enzymes, to use as a flood as well. Remember, they don't really need the mushroom to do the remediation. You need this chemical, you need the keys for the sweat. And then we put that, we can put that back into the auger with the atrazine. It'll actually just break it up fairly quickly within a few days. Uh, putting background contaminants of interest into your auger. Identify what your local pollutants are. Go after them. Try to find out what, what the companies are using. Test the, test the media. See what's in the water. Then you can pick the mushroom species that works best. Put the contamination back into the plates. Train them. Uh, if you don't have plates, if you don't have a lab, you can also do this on cardboard, by the way. Um, I've soaked plates full of herbicide and oil. And you can just put the oyster mushroom mycelium on it, and it'll crawl across the surface, and it'll train itself on that cardboard. Right? And that's where we get into those natural interactions with non-sterile culture. Well, that's why we're taking bacterial samples. That's why the cardboard culture sometimes can be better, because it's naturally picking up its hitchhikers that it wants to cultivate. Right? This is that soaked, contaminated cardboard. We're just making little burritos, again, with contaminated media soaked into the cardboard. Uh, I've also, on the beach, just soaked the cardboard right in salt water and just rolled it up, rolled up mycelium to see if that mycelium can adapt. So if you roll up the mycelium into a tight little bundle, this is an easy trick, and make a burrito, the mycelium <laughs> starts out on the inside, right? All of it's on the very inside. Then it has to drill its way through the contaminated cardboard. And look what happens on the outside. That's where you just take a little piece of that. Those are your infantry cells. They had to push and eat their way through contaminated cardboard. That goes back to a plate, and it's ready to roll. Right. Or you can use this cardboard as uh, spawn. Transfer that to your biomass generation system. Remember, we can't do remediation without biomass. You've got to expand it. But you want to expand intelligent mushrooms. You want to expand that intelligent mycelium that's in the race horse state. You don't, you don't want this to be a, you know, the, uh, in, in a state of rest. Don't, don't discount things that uh, aren't mushrooms. Every fungus is gifted. Right? Turkey tails, um, this little olive, this resupinate fungus that we have uh, in our area is really good at breaking down PCBs and dyes. Um, in my area of, of South Carolina, there's a lot of old textile mills and even denim companies. Denim. They are discharging indigo carmine into the creek. Um, and, you know, I had to look at the data and I went to the owner and I said, yeah, I, I looked at the, uh, the information, freedom of information, and I found out exactly what you're doing and I would like to help. And I told them that, you know, listen, if you're, if you're discharging into a carmine, we're going to find a fungus that breaks it down naturally. And sure enough, uh, this tiny little crust fungus is perfectly good. It breaks down into a carmine in two to three days. Right? Don't discount these other fungi that are growing on wood. Um, there's not a photo of one, but this little glowy off one. Have you, have you, has anybody seen it on the table? It's a gilled polypore. Right? It grows on a lot of different conifers. It's got a lot of chemical keys. Those are awesome, right? So these little crust fungi don't discount because they're not edible. Now, I know a lot of the edibles, and I know Paul's work, he gave a lot of credit to the oyster mushrooms, which one of the most famous. But every mushroom is different, right? We tried it on this, and didn't break down the indigo chromine at all. So the turkey tails work really good. Um, some of the crust fungi. Right. And here's the, you know, here's my contaminated map of South Carolina. Uh, fecal coliforms. You know, you got to know what to, you know, what you're going after. And so when you overlay the cattle population on the state, the cattle industry fits perfectly. <laughs> That's why, completely. Right. All the purples, coliforms. Um, 
so we need to set up those biological filters, but more importantly, uh, up here in North Carolina, we had a, uh, you ever hear about the coal ash spill in North Carolina? Really bad. Um, we're, we're part of a, we're actually screening the soil, looking for microbes uh, and fungi on those sites. We have a big, a nice stash of that soil they gave us. Uh, we're trying to screen them, trying to figure out what happened. But so that's what I'm saying, you have to go on site. So if you're looking at this, I would go after ecotypes that are specific to those farms. Right? The fungi can adapt to them, but what you really want is a uh, native fungi. Period. They work the best. Like the King's Shepharia. Um, it's one of the mushrooms that, uh, yes, you can clone it, but you can't grow it in sterile culture. You have to uh, put the mic, you have to match up the microbes back. So I do a lot of, of stem um, stem saving here. Save and clone this mushroom, save the stem, put it in a blender, and then you could um, refrigerate or freeze that. You'll have all those microbes back together again that it likes to use. All right? for the uh, degradation process. And in the contaminating site, this is my chicken coop, right? They have stripperia planted all in the gift stripperia in your chicken coop. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Good. Um, it's naturally predatory against coliforms, so and it's, uh, it's a magazine, chicken magazine came to my house. I'm in chicken magazines. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Um, they came to our place, and these are free-range chickens. But they, when they're babies, we kept them in this cage, all right, um, and the runt, and we put King's Stripperia all through this. It had a good eight inches. And you dig down, it's a solid mat on my ceiling. Awesome. And the chicken magazine people came over there, and they said, yeah, I heard you were using fungi in your chicken coop. We're just curious if you could write a story about it. And I said, yeah, that's fine. And they came to the chicken coop, and they said, this is the best smelling chicken coop I've ever seen. Right? And on the outside of this chicken coop, there were little King Shakaria hiding all in the shade. And they were completely breaking down all those coliforms. And they're also de uh, deodorizing at the same time. The, back, the, the odor causing bacteria that are in, is in that mulch is gone. Like the moisture levels in the coop. In the coop? Uh, I never had a problem. Um, wet? Yeah. Well, with the chips, which is nice, you could actually water in the chips and let that manure kind of dissolve and wiggle down. Chicken poop is not solid. <laughs> it's it's a lot. It's mostly liquid, so you can water it. It wiggles its way into the chips, and it stays really clean. Um, what also happens is worms are attracted to the mycelium of the king area, and the chickens just snap up the worms. I hate to end up a worm, but. <laughs> Uh, other areas of interest where you could be isolating around manure ponds. All right, this is how to set up one of these swales. But if you're uh, collecting on site, I'm just going to write for the mushrooms that are adapted and specialized to kill those types of coliforms. Right, test them on the plate, clone them, take a soil sample, save that, and put them back together with the contaminant. Uh, highly uh, versatile fungi like this one. These are uh, mushrooms that typically grow on pine trees. That's why I said mushrooms that grow on pine have a very large key set. Pines are very difficult to break down, right? Compared to a hardwood. That's like when they cut, the stumps just don't re they don't reforest very well. Um, this one's Lentinus, or Neo Lentinus lapidius now. It's called the train wrecker. It grows on, it's originally discovered on railroad ties. <laughs> yeah. So it's one of those mushrooms, and the, the image is poor with the light, but the upper right, those train wreckers are growing out of a brand new piece of treated lumber, a post. Okay? Treated lumber is designed to resist rot. <laughs> when you find a mushroom like this, you better clone it. Right? It's a good ecotype. We found some of these uh, just growing on pine naturally, but uh, mushrooms that can break down treated prehistoric lumber. That's the areas I like to dumpster dive in. When I see a big pile of garbage or trash, I'm looking for mushrooms. They just land. So those are like welcome mats. 
when you see contaminated debris or a contaminated site or a pile of trash, right, like that, I would be all over it. When I see this, when I see, I, I'm, I'm in, diving around, digging around, looking for fungi. It might be a little crust washing. It might be a big gill meal on time, you don't know. Clone those. Right. This is the build it and they will come. <laughs> you are laying out uh, contamination. And I do this all the time. I told my microbiology to my advisor, I said, I'm done chasing mushrooms around. I'm just going to leave out a chemical trap for them. A welcome mat. Bait and wait. You know, like a little snare. <laughs> Set up a, contaminate, a contamination. See what shows up. You put more out, wildlife shows up, might do the same thing. All right, so the turkey tail, there's different qualities of the mushroom like this. And these are, um, we've had turkey tails growing on, on different types of treated lumber as well. Um, we, I have one isolate that we uh, took from a cedar tree, right? That's showing very high promise with um, herbicides. Tensile strength of these, yeah. right? How do you clone those? Yeah. Oh, how do you clone turkey tails? Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> um, turkey tails are really thin and papery. So my, my, my trick is, for polypores now, is when you pull it off, you pull it off and the stem attachment has just a tiny bit, this fluffy mycelium on it. Um, I, I get dental tools. <coughs> And um, I, I generally find them at flea markets. Why they sell dental tools at flea markets is a different story. It's crazy, like backyard dentistry. Right. And I just take a tiny little sample when you put it on auger. Okay. You, you'll see. And even the wood colonized, I take a knife and get in and just take some of that colonized wood and put it right on the plate. You know it's, 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 it's not marbled, so you see mycelium, um, white bleached wood. It's got to be turkey tail. Right. Tensile strength. This is King um, Another reason to choose different ecotypes. Figure out which ones are stronger. So when you go back and do an installation, you want to know how strong that mushroom is. You know, morels are really wispy. They have very, they have no tensile strength whatsoever. It's like fiberglass. And you've got other mushrooms like King Stropheria that are like 30 to 40 thousand times the weight. And you have turkey and reishi that they're like 800,000 to a, a million times their weight. They're like a rubber. Okay. So those bacteria that was in that, go back one, I'm sorry. Like strap, why I did this slide is um, inside, look at those rhizomorphs. Right, okay. Stropharia does not produce rhizomorphs in culture, pure culture. It's cottony, it's white, it's slow growing, it's lazy. When you get King Stropheria in a non-sterile environment, especially the microbes that it bonds and forms alliances with, it turns into these huge cores. So they picked up all the bacteria that they need and want to do not only their degradation of their waste, but also things that we want. Natural antibiotics, chemical degradation, molecular disassembly, it's all in here. All right, so those are the bacteria. We need those. We need them to show up, okay, to the remediation site. We got to save them. So if you put that, put it in a dish. I wouldn't put it in a dish. We're going to make a slurry of dilution. That's what we're going to do. So this is research. You don't have necessarily have to do this for a remediation site, but if you wanted to know which microbes that it is partnering up with, you remember the gallery plates I made with the bacteria and the fungi? You just basically make reducing, this is like dilution to extinction, so you're just trying to separate out all the species that it may partner up with. And then you put them back on the plate with a contaminant and see what, which ones they, they made up with. Sounds tedious. It is. Okay. Yeah. How long does like, I don't know, take one sample, how long does that take? A lot. I think it, it's a lot of plates. Think yeah. about it. It's a lot of uh, bacteria. And, and what's interesting too, um, is less than 2% of all bacteria. If you take a soil soil sample, a gram, um, you can only grow 2% of those bacteria in a lab. Two, less than 2% of all bacteria. They cannot, 98% of bacteria cannot be cultured at all right now. So what does that tell you? You think it needs something else alive? Maybe a culture? 
that we don't know about. Maybe the fungi, other organisms. So, like you know, like John was saying, these are like colonies, but you you have interactive interactions that need each other. We separate things out in the lab. That's what scientists do. Stay in your corner. It doesn't work that way. It's got to be a community of uh, organisms. So, oh, hold on, sir. So this is a, a, a one of my modules like this. Uh, you put contaminated, you can put your uh, media in here, and then flow and do a recirculation system. So this becomes a means of, if you have contaminated media training the fungus, you recirculate it, and then this body, of, this mycelium sweats, and then you have all this metabolite here that's specialized just for that contaminant. Does that make sense? We have soaked, maybe cardboard or wood chips that are colonized, and they have atrazine in that contaminant. You sweat it and you collect it. Right? Then you can just drench the soil. You don't need the mushroom at all. This I was talking about tensile strength. You think that would be important yeah. in a wavy action environment? Yeah. What about salt tolerance? Mm -hmm. Looks like mangroves to me. Yeah. Picking the mushroom and, and, and also collecting those native on site. That's why I love going to coastal marine environments because. Uh, of all the issues with uh, oil spills and marine environments, we need salt-tolerant fungi. But collecting them on site is really important. All right. All right. So that goes leads right into the native fungi. You know, it's not wise to use a mushroom from another another ecotype from another region. All right. It doesn't recognize the media that you're growing it on anyway. You think my oyster mushroom from uh, from maybe from Florida? And we try to grow it on aspen chips, you think that it's going to have a little bit of a problem? It would be slow. It would probably figure it out. But if we use a strain that grows on aspen, boom. Very strong. Use this waste native to the region. So we're, we're finding, we're trying to redirect the city's waste, uh, increase the recycling, but also using those fungi that grow on that waste. Uh, engaging other students, if you don't have the means of doing the research of the plates, um, I know the institute. We've got to figure out. You know that big laminar and palm is staying in town. Here, we'll be able to use it for all the remediation in town. So this is becoming a micro micro remediation village. They want it. I think I'm going to hear. Not coming back, old man. <laughs> in the summer, anyway. Um, and bridge, bridge these different environments. So don't don't limit yourself to just mycology. Uh, you need microbiology. You need other engineers. You need uh, people on site who can uh, test and do all these things. So it's a collaborative effort, just like fungi and bacteria uh, and these other microbes. So don't kid yourself. You know, it's a team effort to do all this. And that's what we're wanting here, right? End goal: <laughs> clean water, clean forest, clean wood. All right. Get those toxins out of the food chain. I think that's it.
parcel. The Colorado Division of Energy Recognition is a micro mediation pilot that is in the late 90s and pressed the end, but they didn't do very well. They were flying for about 12 and a half hours a week. So it's a challenge trying to figure something out. The region I'm from has a lot of salt in the water. There's a lot of iron ore mining in North Minnesota. And a lot of lakes over there. A lot of water goes to the lake. So it's kind of a rough area. I mean, I highly encourage just this diversity, collecting on site for everything. That's the purpose of this talk, is you can collect. They're already kind of naturally attenuated to that. And then you've got the ability to take the spores from those and really create a super, you know, they call them super bugs. I don't like calling them mushroom bugs, but, you know. What kind of methods do you use to collect the spores from the plant? Do you use like a pollution control method? What kind of methods? Chemical analysis, HPLC. You can take it out there. If you don't have access to that, I don't even have that. I think we're getting that in our lab. Maybe this fall. It's very expensive to run samples. I haven't reached that level John Holliday's at. Very jealous. And also doing the DNA of those mushrooms too. Different species, even the bacteria. Very important. So when you're trying to break down or get rid of a contaminant, is the sweat from the spores that you use and you just kind of lay it over it and that breaks it down and turns it into a less harmful composition? Yeah, the sweat from the mycelium, not the spores. But yeah, it's cell-free extracts. Now, they work aerobically, remember? That's an aerobic interaction. So if it's a deep contaminant, it's going to go anaerobic and it won't break it down. So you have to aerate the soil. You can add peroxides as a means of sweating in to give it that extra oxygen lift off. It combusts. They combust molecules. They take oxygen and combust them. That's why they produce heat. Carbon dioxide and water. Just like water. If you pull a piece of glass over a fire, water. Heat, carbon dioxide, and water. So mushrooms are just burning it up. Literally burning it. Yep. So as far as subdivision, you mentioned like the plug to the bucket is like 50,000 mycelial miles or something. Yeah. It'll just keep going? It doesn't ever get tired out or it doesn't really? The tips are. I mean, there's senescing. There's away from the parent culture. But the way to kind of, the way to limit that would be to give it something else to eat. And challenge the colonizing cells, the outer edges. It's like a bread culture. The Egyptians kept the yeast a lot because they traded it a lot. So keeping the mixture different. You know, if I gave you oatmeal for the rest of your life, you'd get sick with it. Sure. Your gut, it wouldn't work anymore. Right. You would overproduce certain enzymes and all of a sudden it just, it's like it burns itself out. Okay. Yeah. So with that approach, it is truly limitless like John Holiday? It can be perpetual. But again, the DNA is making copies of itself. Uh-huh. And those copies aren't proofread very well. Okay. They mutate. Uh-huh. So the farther away that mycelium is, the more different it is from right when those two spores germinated in that party. Okay. Very romantic. To think about spores germinating and mating. What are you saying, Chris? I was thinking about the chemical intelligence zone. You know, like how do you explain the chemical intelligence zone? I don't know. I know. It's out there. Give me a gram and I'll tell you. Give me ten grams and I'll tell you how everything works. I think observation is the only way to understand it. And that's why I like mushroom behavior. I had a chapter called Mushroom Psychology in my book. And they took it out. I think they thought it was a little too weird. It's in the director's pet. 
<laughs> I'll email it to you if you want to read it. Uh, it's fun because I, I just, like I said, I, when you watch fungi, they, they react so quickly to changes in their environment. It's not like a plant. I mean, you get a real reaction. If I come at you like this, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to react. Fungi just boom. It's, it's awesome.